Good afternoon friends, welcome to the STP training webinar series. The topic for today is Canavan for Experts. Our speaker for the day is Liz, Liz Q and I'm Smita Mishra, a professional tester myself and I'm excited to host you all and Liz on our STP webinars. Quick information for all of you, the next upcoming conference we have is Fall 2019 STP Con which will be held at Boston from September 23rd to 26th. It's the 10th year anniversary of STPCon. We have supported testers for 10 solid years and built a thriving community of theirs in our own way. And we would like for all of you to join us at the event. The entire program is up for your review and registration. You can view the same at stpcon.com slash event dash schedule. Like always, the topics range from uh, across automation, AI, machine learning, DevOps, performance testing, leadership, mobile testing, security, and so much more. And if you plan to attend the upcoming conference, do not forget there are various discounts and offers for alumni attendees and team registrations. Also, please note that the early bird discount ends on 2nd of August, which is just about a week from now. Please feel free to review all the available options on pricing at the link given on the screen. And if you have queries, do email them at info at softwaretestpro.com. Uh, the email is also given on the screen up there. And there is another piece of information that I have for you. Uh, there's an upcoming webinar, Demystifying Accessibility on 14th of August. The speaker is Crystal Preston Watson, who is a QA engineer at Spruce Labs, in this talk, she will confront misconceptions about accessibility, uh, what it is and what it isn't. And while talking, uh, sorry, while taking an interactive look at how to test for usable, accessible and inclusive applications. The link is up for you to register. Please go for it. And if you are on Twitter, please do share the conference information and about this webinar with your followers and connections. You can also add STP's Twitter handle to your tweets, which is at Software Test Pro. Uh, you could use a hashtag STP webinar. And you can also note down the speaker's Twitter handle for today, which is L-U-N-I-V-O-R-E, Lunivore. All right, so let's get started with the webinar today. A very warm welcome, Liz. We are very excited to have you with us today. Uh, Beyond STP, I'm personally very excited to get, get to hear you, Liz. So let me quickly introduce you for all of us here. Liz Kio is a lean and agile consultant based in London. She's a very well-known blogger and international speaker, a core member of the BDD community, and a passionate advocate of the Canavan framework and its ability to change mindsets. She has a strong technical background with 20 years of experience in delivering value and coaching others to deliver from small startups to global enterprises. Most of her work now focuses on lean, agile, and organizational transformations and the use of transparency, positive language, well-formed outcomes, and safe to fail experiments in making change innovative, easy, and fun. You can look her up uh, on the website, uh, her website for more details, which is lizkio.com. Okay, so testing people, let's get started with the discussion today. And very warm welcome again, Liz, and the floor is all yours now. Thank you very much, Smita. So I thought I'd just say hi in person before I switch to the slide so you can see me. Um, I'm a real life person. I'm coming to you live from London today. It's quite warm here. Uh, let me. Uh, just say, if you do want to ask any questions while I'm talking, I do have my Twitter feed up, so you can just tweet to Lunivor. Um, let me just get the presentation going, there we go. So you should be able to see that now. Fantastic, okay. So 
Um, the thing I wanted to talk about today is the framework Kinevin. It's a framework for making sense of different situations and how to approach them depending on how much certainty or uncertainty they, there is in them. And it has quite a lot of implications for those of us who work in IT. Um, you can see there is my Twitter name and my website as well. Um, so it turns out that as human beings, we're really, really bad at handling uncertainty. We have this particular craving to know where we're trying to go with things, and it causes us to behave in some really odd ways. Um, University College London actually did an experiment with this a few years back. They had an electronic game where people could um, see that they, they could see snakes and rocks. And basically, you turn over the rock, and maybe this rock has a snake underneath it, maybe it doesn't. And in this electronic game, if you accidentally turn over a rock with a snake underneath it, you get an electric shock. And it turns out that um, if, you, if you have a lot of uh, snakes under the rocks, of course, you get a lot of shocks. If you don't have very many snakes, you don't get a lot of shocks. The object of the game is to learn to predict the snake population, so you're not getting all these shocks all the time. It turns out that the people who had the most stress were the ones with a 50% chance of getting a snake under a rock. Not the ones with no snakes under rocks, or very few snakes under rocks. They weren't getting shot very often, they were quite happy. And not the ones who were getting shocked a lot of the time. They, they kind of got used to it or something, but the ones who didn't know whether they were going to get shocked or not. They were the ones with the most stress. They were the ones who sweated the most, had the highest heart rate. Um, there are lots and lots and lots of experiments that show that we would actually rather have bad certain outcomes than hold on to uncertainty. This craving for certainty, for predictability, it actually sells really, really well. Um, here's the Agile Manifesto, okay? So the Agile Manifesto says we, ha we have to respond to change over following a plan. So you might expect that with agile techniques like XP, you would be embracing uncertainty. That's in the Agile Manifesto as well, right? We welcome changing requirements. But here's what actually happens. This is a Scrum Guide. It's trying to optimize predictability and control risk. Um, Scaled Agile Framework talks about routinely and predictably delivering values. So this is what I mean about predictability cells. We crave it, we like things to be predictable. When Dave Snowden first introduced the Kinevin framework, he said, there's a fundamental assumption that a certain level of predictability and order exists in the world, and it just ain't so. So I wanna show you how this happens um, using something a bit more familiar to you before I introduce Kinevin itself. So there's lots of different dynamics in Kinevin, we'll talk about those a bit later, but this is one of them. You probably remember the early days of camera phones, cameras on phones. Most people think of Nokia, but they weren't actually the very first. If you go and look it up on Wikipedia, you'll find there are people like Kyocera and Sharp. And they made camera phones with the cameras pointing towards the user in landscape mode because they thought people would want to make videos with them. And it was a differentiator for them. Nobody else was doing it. So they sold a fair few of those phones, but the internet was quite expensive then, the bandwidth was expensive, people couldn't really make video calls with them. What Nokia did was they spoiled that differentiator, they saw what Kyocera and Sharp and those others were doing and they said, oh, we can do that too. But now we know better, now we're going to put the camera on the back of the phone because we know people want to take photos with it. Now, of course, We've all got two cameras, one on the front and one on the back, because it's really understood, very much cheaper problem. So we go from this very new, very uncertain, full of discoveries problem to something that's becoming understood, to something which is now predictable. And when it's that predictable, you can then build on it. And we get things like Pokemon Go and the other virtual reality apps. Those wouldn't have been possible before mobile phones became as ubiquitous as they are. OK, so you can probably think of lots and lots of places where that innovation cycle has come about. Everything from computers to cars, all the technology we use starts off with this, this differentiating cycle and eventually becomes commoditized and then people can build on it. So let me show you Kinevin. 
It's a framework for making sense of different situations. It's got these five domains. They're not quadrants. As you've just seen, things move around them. The borders are fuzzy. Um, it's not categories. But we do talk about these different domains. There's also one in the middle. OK. So the first domain we come across tends to be the obvious domain. It's problems which either children can solve or if they do require um, some expertise, it's still obvious what the solution is. So I can go to my landlady in my pub, my local, and I can say to her, well, what do you do when the beer runs out? And she says, well, I change the barrel. Obviously, duh. So it's a duh problem. And we can categorise it. We can say, oh, it's a one of those problems. I understand that. As things become more and more complicated, they require more and more expertise. So a watchmaker knows how to fix your watch. A car mechanic knows how to fix your car. Um, the outcome is still known and still predictable. So if you have that expertise, you can look at the problem and close the gap between what you've actually got and what you're expecting. So analysis works really, really well in this domain. The problem comes from down here. Chaos is accident and emergency. It's your house burning down. It's a transient domain. It resolves itself very quickly and it might not resolve itself in your favour. It's also the domain of urgent opportunity, but it's normally regarded as a really bad place to be. And that's why we don't like uncertainty, because we associate it with things going horribly wrong. In chaos, you have to act and act quickly. When I was writing about this for the first time, Ron Jeffries on my blog actually asked, you know, would you want to do something that's not safe to fail in chaos? If you can make something safe to fail, you're not in chaos. If your house is burning and you don't leave it, that's not safe. That's what makes chaos what it is. So that there is no time. There's no time to try things out. You have to act and hope that you make it. This gives us a real problem when we're dealing with the complex domain. So in the complex domain, cause and effect are correlated in retrospect. You can see with hindsight how things emerge. They're correlated very obviously in the obvious domain. With the complicated domain, you can see how cause and effect are correlated if you have the right level of expertise. In chaos, you have to get out of chaos before you can make sense of anything. They're not correlated at all. But in complexity, we can see how things happen in retrospect. Things emerge. My favorite example of this is a company called Ludicor. They had a big online game called Game Never Ending, and they wanted to get more people to play the game. So they invited people to, to come and share screenshots of the game as they were playing. And they set up these tools for for sharing the screenshots. And I guess they thought that players would, you know, they would, people would see how engaged the players were. They would see how pretty the game was. They'd want to come play the game too. But then the dot-com crisis happened and, the, you know, they're running out of money and they're left with this half-finished game and they needed to do something. So they repurposed those tools. People weren't just sharing screenshots with them. They were also sharing photos of landscapes and families and holidays and kittens and animals. And that game became Flickr, the photo sharing site. And you can see in retrospect how it happened, but you couldn't possibly have predicted it. They tried to get Game Never Ending working again more recently. It's still got a very loyal following. And this time they managed to get the messaging for the admins working behind the scenes. So the admins of the game could talk to each other. And again, something weird happened. Um, you know, they ran out of money, something they had to do something with this half finished game. And this time the admin messaging tools became Slack. And Stuart Butterfield, who's the founder of both Flickr and Slack, says, if you want to replicate my success, don't try to create a failed MMO. That's not how any of this works. So in the complex domain, because we can't predict what's going to happen, but we do have some space to make things safe, we have to do what's called probe, which means to try something in a way that's safe to fail. You can think of it a bit like experiment. There is a little bit of difference, but if you want to use the word experiment, that's okay. 
these domains also have some constraints and practices associated with them. So in the obvious domain, we have fixed constraints. I think of it like putting a plug into the wall. There's only really one way to do it and you can't possibly get it wrong. There's one best practice for putting a plug into the wall. In the complicated domain, we have governing constraints. They are rules, they apply to everything. So you can think of physical um, phenomena as being governing. Science is repeatable. There's good practice though, multiple different ways of making things work. You might fix a watch in a different order, depending on you know, how you're feeling that day, um, which cog you happen to have to hand. There might be multiple different ways of doing it. In the complex domain, we have enabling constraints. These are heuristics. They're rules which don't apply all the time. So you can say, okay, this rule applies, but not in this context. I've seen people um, change governing constraints to enabling ones really, really, it, they, it gives a lot of agility. So it, um, it does enable people when you can make these rules permeable. So for instance, um, we've had very heavyweight governing processes where we've said absolutely everything has to go through full UAT. Um, you have to get sign off. You have to make these, these formal change requests unless it's a tiny little bug. And that enables people to get those tiny little bugs fixed really quickly. So it enables that agility. So one of the first things I look for when I'm trying to give people agility is where are those constraints? Where are they really heavy? Where can we make them lighter? From the complexity comes emergent practice. That means we don't know in advance what's going to work when we make changes and what isn't. Some places I've tried to introduce BDD and they've rejected it. They said, no, we don't want to do that. No, our acceptance testing is fine. We don't need to have conversations. And I could push the issue. I could say, oh, no, BDD is really good. You know, I'm an expert. Let me teach you. But I found it's not useful. There's always something else in the context that you can go after instead. It might be the build pipeline. It might be that they really like doing unit level TDD. It might be that if we just call it examples and have conversations around examples and don't call it BDD, maybe they'll, they'll accept it then. Trying lots and lots of things out, especially where human systems are concerned. It's really important. Human systems are generally complex and we don't know how people are going to respond. So try lots of things. Make sure they're safe to fail. That means that um, don't invest huge amounts of yourself. Don't invest huge amounts of time in it. Keep it lightweight. Try some stuff out. When you understand it and when it starts looking like it's going to work, then you can amplify that probe. You can actually get it working more. You can get it working in different places. And then it will be well understood within the context of the organization in which you're working, because every organization is different. In chaos, there are no effective constraints. Fire keeps burning until it's eaten everything up, and that's when it goes out. But it's also the domain of novel practice. Sometimes we think up really innovative ideas when we have absolutely nothing to lose and no way to ask other people whether it looks like a good idea or not. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. In the middle, we have disorder. Disorder is a domain where we don't know which of these dominate, so we behave according to our preferred domain. I have once failed to read the instructions on something complicated, and it was a, a big photographic green screen that I was trying to fold. It was quite springy. I thought it was safe to fail and then I let go and it smacked me in the eye and I got a black eye as a result. So that was treating something complicated as if it's complex, but it's far, far more common to treat complex things as if they can be made predictable. The whole of IT was dominated by big upfront planned waterfall style projects for a very long time. That's disorder. That's pretending that you can predict what you're going to discover on something that's very new and that you've never done before. Something on which you're going to make discoveries, something on which the outcomes are going to emerge. I actually use this scale to help people work out where they are in the Kinevin diagram. If you want to bring it up while you're looking, by the way, there is a Wikipedia page on Kinevin that has that diagram on it. So I ask, who in the world's ever done this before? 
A five is nobody in the world's ever, ever done it. It might not work at all. Four, somebody's done it, but not in this context. So it's still high discovery. We still don't know what's going to work or not in our organization. We don't know how much it cost them. We don't know who enabled it. We don't know what they had already that made it possible for them. All we know is that somebody's managed to achieve the outcome. We don't know whether we're going to be able to achieve the same outcome or not. Three, somebody in the organization's done it before. Or we have access to expertise in a different way, so we can learn it from a book, we can learn it from YouTube. Two, someone in the team's done it before. So we have easy experts right on hand. One, we all know how to do it. It's really, really simple. So you can think of twos and ones of things like, you know, if I, I'm actually a dev, so I think of it as writing a simple web page. Um, it's, it's very easy. I can do that. I can probably even do a little bit of testing. But where things have experts required. This is where BDD really, really um, comes into its own testing practices, which involve conversations with those experts so that everybody starts to understand what that really looks like. And it's predictable. Of course, human beings are complex. We tend to make mistakes. So it's worth not just doing a bit of analysis, but also getting a bit of feedback as well, because we might still fail. Those fives and fours, though, those are complex. Those are high discovery places. We don't know what the outcome is going to look like. I've seen people in meetings spending hours talking through brand new functionality that nobody's even seen, arguing about what the right answer should look like. Analysis paralysis, they call it, or thrashing the sessions. It's much, much better to get the devs to write a spike or a prototype, to get something started that's lightweight, that you can then use to gain that understanding. It's better to get an MVP out to your customers, something really small that shows whether you've got a market or not. When we understand it, then it becomes a three. So this is how they fall into the Kinevin diagram. Those fives and fours, they're where the risk is. There's where the high discovery things are going to be. We don't know what we're going to discover, but you know it's going to be in the new stuff. It's also where the value is. Whenever we do something new, whenever we make a change to some code or a change to our processes, it's because we're trying to get new capabilities or capabilities in a new context that we never had before. So we're always going to be making discoveries. That's why I advise do those first, get those spikes and prototypes out first, because then you've got more time to react to what you discover. And it's still lightweight. If you do need to throw it away, you've spent as little money as possible. Kinevin also has these boundaries between the different domains. And I want to talk a little bit about those two. So one of those boundaries is between the complex and the chaotic domain. The easiest way for me to talk about this boundary is to show you some of the dynamics in the Kinevin domain. We've already seen one of them, this innovation cycle, this thing from differentiators to spoilers to commodities, and then building on that and back to something innovative again. There's a thing called the shallow dive into chaos, though. With a shallow dive into chaos, we're going to separate people so that they can't talk to each other, so that they have no way to check whether an idea seems good or not. So it's like chaos, but we know when we're going to exit. If you've ever used post-it notes in a retrospective or a brainstorming session so that you don't bias each other ideas, that's actually a form of this. If you have a very large group of people, you can separate people into small groups, but we want those small groups to be homogenous, so we get all the testers together, all the devs together, all the managers together, all the analysts together. It's the opposite of Scrum's cross-functional team, but it gives us the widest diversity of ideas between the groups. So that's the shallow dive into chaos. When we've come up with our ideas, we can then re-enter this innovation cycle, and then we, we add into our products again. So we start with something new and then we come back into a much more stable pattern. 
startups do something that we call oh sorry a small percentage of things do stabilize it is very small thinking nails screws etc okay so startups do something that we call chaos grazing i see it in startups particularly what they do is they're coming up with these ideas oh and there's an urgency to it because they don't have enough money they're running out of money they're running out of funding they've got to start making some money somewhere so they try the ideas out, try the ideas out, try the ideas out. And when they find something that works, they stabilize it just enough to move on to the next thing. And then they find something that works, stabilize it to move on to the next thing. And you'll find generally that startups, they don't have often really great testing practices. And they're often racking up a lot of tech debt. And this can actually be a problem when starts, the startups do become stable they do find that they've got a product and they start to grow because at that point they really want to enter this innovation cycle again i have people in companies which have grown they get to about 50 60 people and they say it doesn't feel like it used to well of course it doesn't you had a sense of urgency before but now you've got 70 people trying to pay their mortgages you can't afford to take the same risks that you were taking before and what you tend to want is stability you want to get the devops practices in place you want to get this tech debt that you built up while you were busy getting it working getting it working getting it working you want to start paying that down because you need things to be stable at this stage i've been working with regulated companies that once they were up and running actually getting everything stable and making sure they didn't have a regulatory breach it's a really big deal I think testers have a huge role to play in that as well. Okay, so that's that um, complex to chaotic boundary, the liminal threshold from complex to chaotic. The most important thing is just to manage the exit. So you're going to know when you're going to come out and bring everything together and share what ideas you came up with. That's how you exit the chaos. Okay. So. We have this other threshold between the complex and the complicated. And this one's really, really interesting because I worked, I work a lot with, I'm obviously an agile coach, so I work a lot with agile teams. This is actually where agile spends most of its time. If we were truly, truly in chaos, we would have what they call multiple parallel probes. That's people independently working on things to try out without really sharing them with each other. I've done this once when we had to come up with some ideas for a trading UI and three of us, three developers went off and coded the UIs with a bit of a chat to the analysts independently and then showed them to each other. And we actually kept aspects of a couple of them. But it's far more common that there's some solution we think we're heading towards. We don't quite know what it looks like yet. We've got a bit of expertise around it. And so we're actually iterating towards that solution and we're probably only trying one thing. That's what we're doing in that liminal boundary. It's one thing, not multiple parallel things. If you're working with very high uncertainty, I recommend that approach of trying multiple, multiple things. And there it is, that's Kinevin, fantastic. So let's talk a little bit about probes, because the complex domain is the one that we trip up most in. The complex domain is the most interesting of these from a software point of view. So I want to talk about what a safe to fail probe really looks like. It has five criteria, really simple. One of them is a way of knowing whether it's succeeding. Otherwise, you won't be able to amplify it. Another is a way of knowing it's failing. Otherwise, you won't be able to stop it from failing. And of course, you have to have a way of stopping it from failing and a way of amplifying it if it's succeeding. The last thing it has is called coherence. This is a realistic reason for thinking that a probe might have a positive impact. The way I always think of it, because I'm a BDD, is can you give me an example? It doesn't have a way of avoiding failure completely. Some probes will fail. Some things you try out won't work. If you've ever seen those MVPs that people put out where you put a button on an app, but when you click the button, it says, oh, we're, we're working on this at the moment. Thank you for showing your interest. Sometimes people aren't interested and sometimes those features never get built or they get built much later. 
So I wanted to talk about this emergence and what that really looks like and why things have to be safe to fail. You get side effects in complexity that are not necessarily what you might expect. So being testers, you're probably all familiar with the idea of SMART criteria. But when we're thinking about probes, we can think about those ways of knowing it's succeeding, ways of knowing it's failing. But I once went to this company and they had this really interesting graph on the wall. They had numbers at one side from zero to 100 and they had uh, dates along the bottom. And I looked at it and I said, oh, is that your bug count? They said, yes, it is. I said, that's a really interesting graph. What's happened? They said, well, we had too many bugs. They've been going up for a bit. And so we thought we would bring the bug count down. We're going to hire a new developer and then rotate an existing developer through a bug fixing role. So that's what we did. Um, we rotated the devs and we fixed bugs. There's always one person fixing bugs, fixing bugs, fixing bugs. And there you can see the bug counts going down. And it worked so well, we thought we'd do it again. So we hired another new developer and rotated another existing team member through a bug fixing role. And then the bug count started to go up. As a human being, we really love doing root cause analysis. And we often jump to patterns that we see. And then we get fixated on those patterns. And the pattern I saw was, oh, was that new developer you hired? No good. Oh, the developer was fine, he said. It wasn't the dev. Did the team get really complacent then? I said. No, it wasn't that either. Was the code base getting too big, too complex? No, it wasn't that. I kept guessing and kept guessing, and the two people I was talking to were looking at me with these really big grins on their faces. And I said, well, where were the bugs coming from then? Who was reporting them? They said, ah, it was the users. The bugs were already there. But the users had spotted that we'd started fixing the bugs, so they were much more willing to report them. So the fact that the bug count was going up was actually a good thing. Imagine that. This is what you get with side effects. OK. So emergence is really, really crucial when we're thinking about um, how human systems behave. And I really like the Agile Fluency model because it describes a pretty typical pattern of emergence without going into any of the detail of it. So they say that when you actually adopt um, Agile for the first time, it tends to be with something like Scrum. And you've got a team. They don't really have great technical practices, but they're learning how to focus on what the product owner, what the person who cares about this, this change you're making really wants, the problem they're trying to solve. And they're learning how to redirect their energy towards that. They're probably not shipping every two weeks because most organizations, large ones particularly, shipping things is really hard. It's normally another group called IT operations who's responsible for that. And it can take a while to get ops on board. Then you finally do get ops on board. You start talking to them. And all DevOps is, is devs and ops working together. But they do start picking up some of each other's skills and the skills necessary to manage, build pipelines, and get things delivered and automate the testing. And as they pick up those skills, they get good at delivering. And then you start seeing these small releases come in. That first phase of focusing only takes a few months. Delivering actually tends to take a good couple of years to get good at. XP teams, um, Jim Shaw and Diane Larson, who came up with this, Diane Larson reckons that XP teams often start with delivering instead of um, actually focusing on things. So they're delivering, but they're probably delivering the wrong stuff. And it's OK, because part of the delivering things they're doing is actually making it easier to change. So even if they do get it wrong, at least they can change direction. But you don't be surprised if you do find some teams, they don't quite have good testing practices. They're definitely not automated testing yet. By the time we get to optimizing, ops are fully on board. And the business has started really paying attention to what's going on over in IT. And IT aren't really seen as a service center anymore. They're seen as a partner 
ship. So the business is saying, well, hold on, if you can ship all these small things, could you just try this? Could you just try this? And they're doing probes of their own. MVPs, little experiments. And then something happens in the marketplace and they see an opportunity for disruption and they shift their organizational culture to take advantage of those kind of disruptions. Diana Larson described that to me as a bit of a red herring, that fourth place, that strengthening place that you get to. Most organizations, even the best of them, only get to three. And that's plenty. I think four is a little bit like that urgent opportunity in chaos. It doesn't really last for very long, and that's OK. So we have these different outcomes in the Kinevin diagram. We have predictable outcomes in the complicated domain, emergent outcomes in the complex domain, and we're trying to avoid chaos. That's the outcome we're really looking for in the chaotic domain. We don't want to be in chaos in the first place. So I thought I'd share some of the patterns that I see from that some of the practices from XP that I see and where they actually belong. So TDD, when you're doing test driven development, you do actually have to define the outcome you're looking for. That's the thing you're going to look for at the end of your writing your tests. So TDD is actually very, very hard to do in the bits of the spike in the prototype that are really, really new. You might do it for some of the known bits, but I found it's much more likely that I'm hard coding things and not quite sure what's happening. And really, the behavior that I'm, I'm looking at is so simple, it's impossible to do much TDD with it. BDD and testing are exactly the same because they require a known outcome to test against. When you're looking at emergent outcomes, the tester's role is more to make sure that what you're really doing really is safe to fail. Testers are great at spotting ways in which the things are not safe to fail, in which you can't possibly put that spike live. Here's how it might go wrong. Customer tests, also down there with the predictable outcomes. The planning game is focused on what you're going to produce at the end of the iteration. When you're pairing, pairing actually works really, really well when you have expertise to pass on and a known outcome that you're working towards. If it's really super boring, you don't really need to pair on it. And if it's very, very complex and uncertain, it's actually much better to just develop independently and then bring what you find together. I do wonder, though, if we might not get more pairing with testers rather than just devs together. Small releases are fantastic. They turn things which were emergent into something that's now predictable. So when we do a small release, we know whether it's working or not, and we've limited the amount of errors. We're getting these fast feedback loops that tell us whether what we're trying out is good or not. And of course, when XP was written, DevOps wasn't really a thing. Build pipelines weren't really a thing. Now, this can be made much, much easier, much, much safer than it was back when I was practicing as a developer. Refactoring takes these emergent outcomes and allows for safety, in fact. So it prevents you from um, entering disorder. So if you're not refactoring, you've got a code base which um, it's likely to cause you problems in the future, and that might not be safe to fail. Similarly, with continuous integration, we talked about build pipelines. Simple design is an enabling constraint. Collective ownership involves human systems, it's very complex. Um, sitting together, similarly, human systems. And then we have the whole team, again. Coding standards, another enabling constraint. So these are all the XP practices. Sustainable pace, of course, is there to help us avoid chaos again. And there's the spikes and prototypes. OK, we missed one. I don't know if anybody can tell what it was. It's a system metaphor. System metaphors are really, really super interesting to me. A metaphor is like a little story about something that's taken from a different domain that shares some of the same characteristics or patterns. And I really like this from a Kinevin perspective because <clears throat> when we're looking at multiple parallel probes, there's a couple of things that you should look to try and include if you really want to be certain that you're trying the, a wide variety of ideas. 
one of them should be oblique. So you're going to take something in the context of the problem and target that instead of targeting the problem directly. This is like me saying, oh, if you don't want to do BDD, that's fine, and going after the build pipeline instead. Um, there's other things in the context that you can always, always go after. The other one is naive. A naive probe is one that's thought of by an expert from something else who comes into your domain. So for instance, you could get a lawyer to come and look at your code and maybe you'll find out something about regulations and the way that regulators behave, which might allow you to do something different. Um, Dave Snowden's very fond of inviting sociologists and anthropologists in who can make really great observations about how humans behave in systems. So I think the system metaphor, this idea that we're going to get stories from outside of our experience, from outside of our expertise, it's most like doing this. And this is called managing for serendipity, this bringing an expert in from somewhere else. We're going to cause serendipitous, coincidental conversations, which might result in something truly innovative happening. So there you go. That's Kenevin. That's everything about it, really. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. you yes. Question? Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Liz, for an insightful session on Kenevin. And yes, we do have a couple of questions. Give me a Fantastic. second as I go to them. Yes. All right. So the first question here is: um, You mentioned on one of our on one of your slides as startups do chaos grazing, and yes. you also mentioned that testers could help there. Can you explain that part better? How could testers sure. Um, support? Sure. So um, chaos grazing, because you're only just stabilizing things just enough to go live. I think Tester's role is it's less to make sure that every single thing works. It's more to make sure that things that don't work aren't going to harm anything. So just to give you an example of that, um, I joined Monzo Bank. I'm in the beta program, so I'm a beta user. And you'll find a lot of startups have these in beta users. We're more prepared to put up with bugs than most people are. And my partner and I, we got a joint account with them through their beta program. And as soon as the account was opened, which really didn't take very long at all, we tried to put some money in the account and nothing happened. We didn't even get an acknowledgement. We got no confirmation, nothing at all, just nothing. And I was a little bit worried because I didn't know what had happened. Had the money gone from my account? Had, had it actually gone from my other account? Did I manage to transfer it successfully or not? I couldn't tell. But I could see when I looked that the money was still in my account. It hadn't actually left my other bank account. So the payment hadn't gone through. Um, the request for the payment hadn't even gone through. Now, if that money had left my bank account and then disappeared into the ether, that would not have been OK. That would not have been safe to fail. But because it was just a little bug about the fact that Actually, I had to wait until my card arrived and then activate my card. And once my card was activated, then yes, I could transfer money into the account. Um, that was the bug. And because it didn't actually affect my money, I'm OK with it. But testers are really, really good at saying, hey, can we check this thing that absolutely must not fail? Things like, where's the money gone? Are we risking? Um, exposing people's private data. Is it secure? I've seen um, initial startup login forms where the password was just being passed straight over the wire in plain text. That's not safe. That's really not safe because people do still reuse passwords. And if you're doing that, the chances of their password getting grabbed by somebody who happens to be on the same Wi Fi in the coffee shop is not zero. So I think testers have a role to play there in just um, thinking about what is safe and what isn't. Um, 
I'm a dev. I don't really notice. I'm very, very good at thinking up solutions. I'm not brilliant at seeing all the problems that I'm creating. And I think testers are much, much better at that than I am. So even in that chaos grazing space, I would still want a tester around or somebody with that problem finding mindset. That's the strength that testers really have. That's why I need you all so much. That makes yeah, brilliant. That makes a lot of sense. Yes. Um, there's another question here where cool. it says, where is a good fit uh, for AI public ML driven tests? I think you're asking how can Kenavin fit there for so AI, AI or ML? Sorry, and what's driven tests? Uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning driven tests. So I'm not an expert in AI or machine learning. Um, I know from having the little bit of work that I've done with teams that it can be really, really tricky to test um, those. I would suggest from what the, the places I've seen machine learning go wrong, it's where the input hasn't been inclusive. And that's something I'm deeply passionate about with the testing community particularly. It's, there's such a diversity of people um, just saying, you know, is this inclusive? Um, when we do, and again, when we do this machine learning, is it safe to fail? There's a brilliant talk um, by Karina Zona on machine learning failures. I highly, highly recommend. Um, she's CC Zona on Twitter. Uh, she talked about a supermarket that could predict purchases that you were going to need based on what you bought already. And based on what this 14 year old girl was buying, recommended stuff for a baby. And her father was really irate and went into the supermarket and said, why are you, why are you sending me this? And it actually did emerge that she was pregnant. But she was robbed of her chance to actually tell her father that herself because of the machine learning. And I think, again, testers are gonna be great at spotting those problems. Um, we've particularly had problems with uh, photos and image recognition and different races. So there's there's problems with photo sites being able to recognize dark skinned people because they've trained mostly on white skinned people. Um, I think that testers would be one of the people that I would expect to notice stuff like that. So again, that places where it's not safe to fail. I'm not an expert in it, so probably people who are could could tell you more. Uh, no, actually, you put it very rightly, Liz. In fact, uh, from what little I understand about machine learning, I believe um, uh, can even, can actually be a very good tool because um, you know the, the way you explained about the innovation cycle and the way things are getting stabilized uh, in various cycles over a period of time. Uh, pretty much the algorithms work the same way. We keep putting the inputs and they start taking, I mean, giving the output of patterns over a period of time. So as many number of passes happen, the algorithm starts stabilizing and giving us a pattern. Yeah, yeah I'm so, familiar with that, that as well. Yeah, yeah. My partner's worked a lot more with machine learning. He tells me a bit about it, but uh, I have yes. a chance. So. So this this makes perfect sense. In fact, uh, I see a lot of similarity there. So maybe that's something we could again look at deeply later on. Mm, one final question here, Liz. Uh, it's about system metaphor, where you mentioned that the probe portfolio should include oblique. So uh, yeah. one where it is not targeting the problem directly. So can you uh, explain that oblique probe again? Right, let me just get to that point. Cool. Um, so an oblique probe, it's something which targets the context of the problem, but doesn't approach the problem directly. If you want a book on um, obliqueness, I highly recommend John Kay. He wrote a book called Obliquity. So it's K-A-Y. Um, that's all about obliqueness and how sometimes when you try to hit a problem directly, um, you you don't solve it. The example he used in that book was he took pairs of companies. Um, so he took uh, pairs of petroleum companies and pharmaceutical companies and banks and investment houses, bunch of different people. And he said, consistently, 
the people that mentioned profit in their corporate strategy um, were the ones who made the least. So you don't make profit by targeting profit. You make profit by targeting your customers and by um, having really great engineering practices um, because that reduces your costs and allows you to change your direction easily. So um, that's an example of obliquity. At a smaller scale within teams, um, we have things like the tests always fail. And I've seen people say, you know, why can't you get those tests passing? We've been asking for this for, for absolutely ages. And, you know, as soon as I hear that repetition failing, somebody's asking for something and it's failing, it's failing, it's failing. That's that's the backfire effect. That's somebody there is starting to have an emotional response to what they're being asked. And it may be that they don't understand the code base. It may be that you know they don't have the right expertise. It may be that they're just really overworked and they've got more important things to do. We don't really know. There's so many contexts in human systems. We don't know why they're resisting that change. So instead of going after the change and saying, no, but you must do it, which would be a governing constraint, which belongs in the complicated domain. We're dealing with people, so let's put some enabling constraints in instead. It might be as simple as getting visibility over the tests, you know, a, a dashboard, a TV somewhere in the room that shows the failing build. Um, one of the coaches I was training actually did that, and it had a dramatic effect. People really wanted the build to be green instead of red. And they fixed the build, they fixed the flaky tests, they worked out what was going wrong, and they did it together because we showed them that the build, you know, it wasn't attacking the real problem directly. It went round the problem and did something else that was related instead of saying, just fix the test. I've seen loads and loads and loads of examples of that. Loads of examples. So um, you could do things like, if they don't want to learn automated testing end to end, if the devs don't want to help with the automated testing, maybe they'll do some TDD instead. Maybe they might want to learn some TDD. And it turns out that some actually, once you've learned TDD, BDD, you know, end to end BDD does actually work at the unit level as well. Um, but end to end system, automated system testing makes a lot more sense too. So, not by going after the problem directly, but by looking what other practices could we pick up? What other things could we try instead? Maybe if we did pairing, somebody who does know how to do automated tests would be able to show somebody. Um, maybe if we paired with a tester, maybe the tester could ask the right questions, which would lead to a dev wanting to automate because then at least you can answer the, the most obvious, do the acceptance tests pass? You know, um, it's that kind, that's what an oblique probe looks like. It's trying to do something in the context, not attacking the problem directly that you're looking at. That that makes a lot of sense, Liz. Thank you so much. Yeah, that helps. Uh, and that ends our questions. So I'm sure our attendees found the session as well as the Q&A pretty useful. So I'm just going to leave this up uh, for a moment just so that people can see my blog that's up there. Yes. And if you do have any questions, you want to ping me, I'm Lunivor on Twitter. Um, I'm always around. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Liz. And I hope to see you at STPCon soon someday. That would be good. Bye, Sunita. Bye, everybody. Thank you. So, everyone, this concludes our webinar for today. So thank you for joining and more importantly, thank you for making it uh, engaging and more, thank you for making the most of the webinar for yourself and the group. If you want to see more such sessions or learn more about testing, do join us at STPCon Fall 2019. The program is up and uh, up there for your registration. You can look at the pricing op uh, options too. And if you have queries on registrations, please do email them at info at softwaretestpro.com. Stay tuned for more webinars and online trainings coming soon at softwaretestpro.com. And if you haven't yet signed up for the upcoming webinar, which is Demystifying Accessibility on the 14th of August, uh, please have a look. The speaker is Crystal Preston Watson, 
who is a QA engineer at Spruce Labs. And in this talk, she will confront misconceptions about what accessibility is and isn't. If the topic interests you, please register for the same at softwaretestpro.com. Thank you, everyone. Have a great week ahead. See you all in Boston in September. Keep practicing your testing. Thank you.